Welcome to the second of the 12 programs that we're doing in WebVision. This time we talk about uh, gates 6 to 10 in the body graph. Uh, we have some more interesting stories from, uh, from Ra as he walks around Ibiza in different places, different location this time. And we've also got a 4-6 profile, Martin Gressinger. And he's talking about what it's like to have a 4-6 profile. And you can understand more about that from him. Um, I do hope you enjoy this program. We've had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, welcome to WebVision. Thank you. Okay, we're going to now look at the 4-6 profile. The 4-6 profile is quite a profile. It's, it's the, the bottom line on the upper trigram. So just as the 1-3 that we talked about earlier on was the bottom line on the lower trigram, this is the bottom line on the upper trigram. So again, it has to be a foundation, but a foundation for transpersonal activities. Now, any, anyone with a six line in their profile would lead three different lives. Up until the Saturn return around the age of 28, 29, the sixth profile will be in the intensity of the world. They will be basically a three. So in this case, it would be a four, three profile. And what do we know about the three? We know it's going to be mutative. We know it's going to be changed. We know things are going to bump into it. The third line also has the ability of making and breaking bonds. So the 4-6 in the first 28 years of its life will actually go through a fair amount of mistake making and and a certain amount of um, well intensity it would rather forget and it gets to a certain point when it jumps up onto the roof in other words it becomes aloof from its own life and enters into the middle stage for 20 years this is where it'll watch everything and there's a certain voyeuristic um, attribute to the 4-6. In other words, they will be watching what happens to people. Rather than them want to do something, they'd rather see someone else do it and see what happens. So great observers, like anyone with a 6 line in the profile, will want to observe, will want to see what's happening. You know, they will be looking to see what's going on with the other. Remember, it's the foundation for transpersonal communication. So aloof from their own life, almost as if life was running through them, almost as if it was not their own life in this 20-year period up until the Chiron, around the age of 50 to 51 years old. From then on, they then come back off the roof, usually with some drama. You know, it can be, uh, it can be a health problem, it can be a career change, it can be a move change, it can be a relationship change. There's a kind of perfection in every six-line profile. They want, they want something to be really perfect. It never really can be for six-line people until after their Chiron, but they move towards it. Now, in the final stage of their life, which can be very long, it can be 30, 40 years from, from 50 onwards, um, this is when they really can meet the kind of perfection they want to. They can really enter into their life as they would have liked it to be, providing they have watched closely, providing they have learned and become wise during their 20-year period on the roof. Something else about the four in this. Now, the four as a personality, this is about friendship. It's about making friends. You'll see any four, six is going to smile a lot. They're actually going to be, they want to be accepted by others. So there's going to be a certain amount of smiling friendliness. You know, they're going to come across as being someone you can really be a friend with. They know through the, um, the keynote of opportunism that all opportunities come to them through people they know, through friends or family or acquaintances. So if they want to keep the doors open, they'll have address books to die for, there'll be lots and lots of connections. That doesn't mean they're going to have a lot of very good true friends, they may just have a few good true friends, 
but they will know people and they will know people who will know people who will know people who will know people. So if you want something done, ask a four or six and they will find the right people for the job or tell you about them. Um, Depending again, you've got to take at the profile and look at their type and uh, the characteristics to really understand. But that gives you an idea of what the 4-6 profile is. And uh, it's, it's very influential. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't bend, it will break rather than bend, being this fourth line. Quite rigid in that, but also quite influential. And it'll externalise what it learnt in the first part of its life. So it'll put forward values and behaviour that it learnt early on and externalise that out into the world. About, you know, for about 12 billion years, the universe has been expanding. All right. Now, look. My knowledge is that, first of all, I don't call it the universe, I call it the biverse. As far as I know, the biverse is an unborn entity. In other words, that the totality is something that is not yet entered into the world it belongs to. It's very much like a fetus in a womb, if you will. Now, in order to understand the point at which that fetus will emerge from the womb, in other words, in order to understand the point at which the biverse reaches its initiating maturity, okay, birth, if you will, the, the only way to do that is to understand exactly the mass. It's like weighing the fetus or taking a, you know, a, a, a sonic impression of a fetus. It's about being able to measure when it's going to reach its critical mass. Now look, we have three theories amongst the physicists, three of them. We have the, the theory of expansion. And the theory of expansion is that nothing is going to stop the momentum of us moving further and further and further away until ultimately everything is deadly cold and everything dies off. In other words, a very lonely end for the universe. The other one is a theory of collapse. The first one's called the inflationary theory. You know, everything's inflating outwards. You know, and then you have the collapsing theory. The theory is that the universe will get to a certain point of critical mass in which the mass of the universe will actually become more than the push of it going outwards and it'll begin to collapse backwards, which is great for science fiction writers because basically you start your life old and you, you live your life and crawl back into the womb. In other words, everything will go backwards. You know, and it might be interesting to see how that looks, you know, what that feels like, and actually you would get senility at either end, eh? You know, it's sort of the same movie anyway. I mean, by the time you're ready to go back into the womb, you don't know what the hell's going on. But anyway, everything would go back to the original, you know, and then supposedly it would start again and, you know, silly kind of yo-yo. The other is steady state. Um, I'm a steady state exponent because that's what I was told. And everything so far I've been told has been verified, so I'll stay with steady state. And steady state is simply that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a point of equilibrium between the momentum of the inflationary biverse and its development of mass. Now you see, you can't figure that out unless you understand how mass works. What actually is the difference between a black hole and another object. The difference is what we call its relative mass. I mean, according to what we understand, a black hole has a mass that's so dense that even when light touches it, it strips the light and turns it into matter. I mean, that's its gravitational force. I mean, it's not black and it's not a hole. You know, all it is is material, and it's material that's deeply, deeply compressed, and out of that it has an extraordinary mass that pulls everything to it. But what controls that? See, this is what nobody knows. They don't know how that all works. For example, what gives a gas planet like Jupiter its, its massive weight? I mean, it's a gas planet. What gives it its mass? What exactly is that? That hard core that's in the center? We don't really know. We don't know because we don't understand gravity and we don't know how mass works. Now, I know it's really simple. And every single one of us has the instrument of that within our bodies, sitting here in our sternums, in the G-Center, 
It's called a magnetic monopole. You know, the joke for me is that the physicists for years have been looking for monopoles up there somewhere, as if they're floating around in space. All they have to do is look inside a human being, as an example, or any living thing. They will immediately find one if they know how to look. If they know how to look. Anyway, sitting in here is a magnetic monopole. Now think about the magnetic monopole. It's, it's hard for us to understand this. It is a magnet that only attracts. Right? So it never repels. It's the essence of what we call love. That's why it's in the G Center, where love resides. Right? This is the magnetic monopole. Now think about it. The magnetic monopole holds you together in the illusion, in the illusion of your separateness. It holds you together. Now I know, I truly know, there's nothing here, you know? I mean, this bag of bones, I mean, this is an incredible illusion. It really is, eh? Okay, so we get held together in this illusion of our separateness by the monopole, but that illusion of our separateness has a relative mass. That relative mass is determined by the monopole. Let me give you a science fiction scenario, okay? Within the consciousness of humanity lies a dream, an incredible dream. It has been there from the very, very first human being, and it's the dream to fly. It's the dream to fly. Every human being carries within them a dream of flying, of rising up. That's why we have this whole thing in our spiritual mythology about the rising up. We have all of this stuff, all of the levitation, the whole business, all of this stuff. You know, the Tibetan monks who are soaring over the, the hilltops. We have all of this inside of us. It's this dream. Now think about what that means. You've got a magnetic monopole that holds you together in the illusion of your separateness. It creates the illusion of your separateness. It creates the illusion of your mass. What if there was a way to adjust that? So instead of the illusion of your separateness weighing 140 pounds, you know, you weighed, well, you know, a quarter of an ounce. You know, let's say that you weighed the same as an atom. And suddenly you just lift off the ground. Because right? it's all illusion. Okay, we come now to the eighth gate. The eighth gate is on the throat center. It's in the middle of the throat center, going towards the G center. And it's part of the channel, the 1-8, the channel of the creative role model, the channel of inspiration. Now this is, a, it also has a voice. It's in, it's in the throat, so it has a voice. It says, I can or I can't. I know I can or I know I can't. It's about a contribution. It's an individual contribution that one gives in order to help a group process. So it's about you know, how the individual effort can go out there into the world and help a group. It's about contributing. It's the agent to the inspiration. In other words, these people can be good agents for other people. And if they have the 1-8, they can be an agent for themselves. But basically, it's about going out there into the world with activity to contribute in some way, in their own individual way. Each and every one of you are really unique. I know that, I know that genetically. It's not spiritual, it's mechanical. You know, that's the whole point of all of this. You know, is that slowly but surely people begin to get it. You know, the moment that you leave out your uniqueness as yourself, you get your mythology. And everybody else does. You know, they begin to experiment. They begin to see that it really works.